Okay, church, 1 Corinthians 13, let's find it and stand again. We've been in this passage for a number of weeks, and we'll continue there for a few more after this. Uh, We're going to focus primarily on verse 6 today. That's going to be the subject of the message, just that one verse, verse 6. But I'm going to go ahead and read some of the context again, just so we can hear Paul's words and his own his own flow of context here. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Remember, the Bible is God's holy word. It is infallible. It is inerrant. It is inspired. You ready? Here we go. Verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. And since that's our verse, let me read it again. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with The truth, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, nobody came here to be entertained today. And if they did, they came to the wrong place. Lord, it is not my job to tell jokes or to be funny. It is not my job to be witty or clever. It is not my job or my duty to impress with fancy words of philosophy or opinions on politics. My job, Heavenly Father, as it always is every Lord's Day, is to read the Word of God and to preach it, believe it, stand on it, exhort it, admonish when necessary, And pray that all along your Holy Spirit would be the one who's really doing the work behind me, in front of me, around me, beside me. May you do the work of conviction, Heavenly Father, and may I get out of the way and let the Bible say what it says to us, a very desperate and needful generation we are. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Keep your Bible open, though. You're probably going to need it. Now, listen, we've been talking about love here for uh, several weeks at Faith Church, and uh, we're midway into the series on 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. And as I look around, I've got to say, I think it's working. I really do. Have you noticed? It seems like there is just love everywhere. I mean, first of all, the sun is shining brighter lately. Have you noticed that, or is that me? It is definitely shining brighter lately, and the days are longer, and the days are are hotter, and the gentle rains have come. Now, that's got to be due to this series, don't you think? Now, some people might say, I know, that's summertime and the weather's changing, but I don't buy it. I think it's the preaching of this love series that's doing the work. What do you think? You join me in that? And not only that, but look around you. I see couples right now holding on to each other. I see husbands with their arms around their wives. If you're not doing that, hint, hint, right now, guys. There you go. Thank you, Bill. Uh, see some of you doing that. I think it's the love series. I think that's what's happening here. I've been looking around at the staff meetings, and people are whistling. People have been skipping down the halls. A musical broke out at the session meeting the other day. That rarely happens. You ever watch a musical, and you say to yourself, why doesn't that happen in real life? It happened just the other day at a session meeting. I couldn't believe it. It was fantastic. I love preaching about love, and you love hearing about love. Amen? Amen. In fact, I'm going to prove it. I've got this new app on my phone. Did you get this? It's the new Thought Revelation app where you take a picture of somebody, you can actually see what they're thinking. And so I was coming out of church on the Lord's Day last week, and I happened to snap this picture right there. He's so patient and kind lately. What a great sermon series. Isn't that an awesome app I've got on my phone? You can get that on your phone, too. This sermon series has been great. And then the other day, I was at Luigi's having, having a nice spaghetti dinner. I turned behind me, behind me. I looked to the couple behind me, and there they were, once again, loving this series on 1 Corinthians 13. So I'm loving preaching it, and you're loving to hear it because everybody loves to talk about love. It is good. It is right. It is wonderful. But today is the day 
that I kicked a hornet's nest. All right? Uh, Today is the day that I am going to tick some people off because we come to verse 6 of chapter 13 today. And to be honest, this verse is going to take us down a little bit of a, a different road. Uh, Verse 6 is going to be an uncomfortable verse for me to preach, and it's going to be a bit of an uncomfortable verse for you to hear, Because, but we got to do it, because uh, like I said in my prayer opening up this morning, I'm not up here to entertain you, I am not up here uh, to make you feel good about yourself. My job is to open the book, peel back the cover, read what it says, and preach that to the church, and so that's exactly what I intend to do. And I expect... And because I've been around this game for a few times around the block here, I know how this works. So when I do a sermon like this, some of you are going to love me, and you are going to want to carry me out on your shoulders. At the end of the game, like I just won it with a last-second field goal, you're going to think this was the best message that you've heard in a while. And there's going to be others of you, and I just know it because this is how it works, that are not going to like this message. It's going to make you feel uncomfortable, and you're going to go home, you're going to make a Pastor Matt Pinata and you're going to beat it, and you're going to key my car on the way out of the parking lot, and it's the prism parked over there. I'll make your job easy for you. And you're not going to like it. You're going to write me a letter that says, Pastor Matt, you were mean today. You were mean. You're supposed to talk about love and joy and peace, and you were mean. And I know that's how it's going to work, but that's okay, because that's what God's Word does to us sometimes. And so I'm just going to exhort you at the top of the sermon to go ahead and put on your hard hat right now. And if you've got the steel-toed boots, let's go ahead and put those on right now. I'll give you a second to lace them up. And while you do that, let me remind us where we're at in this series. Let me do a little bit of a review with you because uh, last week, if you were here, uh, we took a break from the 1 Corinthians 13 series. Uh, John Cleveland, our youth director, came up, did an amazing message. Uh, we had Memorial Day last week. We did Graduation Sunday. And so we, we kind of turned a corner last week. But now we're back to it. And so let me remind you of the definition the working definition of love that we've built so far in this series, and it's going to go something like this. Here we go. Love is an affection, that that means a strong emotion, where in the heart that cherishes, prizes, and treasures another for their own sake without any pretense or false motivation. And so by the time I say the final amen, You're going to know why I tagged on those last few words about without pretenses and false motivation. You're going to see why that's in our definition. So let me give you the big idea Uh, right out of the gate. I'll give you the big idea of what I'm going to try to say, and then I'm I'm going to have two main points with a couple of sub points to support that. So the main idea is this. Love loves the truth, but we don't always love the truth, but love does. Love loves the truth. And so here's the beef that you're going to have with me during this sermon. You remember that old commercial, Where's the Beef? How many of you are old enough to remember Where's the Beef? Some of you look at me like I'm crazy. The rest of you know what I'm talking about. I'll just give you the beef. Here's what you're going to be mad at me about. What I'm going to tell you today is that some of what you've experienced in your life is not really love. All right? I'm just going to say it. I'm just going to say it flat out. You think you've had love, and and it's not. And it's not love, because love rejoices with the truth. And it does not rejoice in wrongdoing. So you may have experienced all kinds of emotions in your heart before. All right, it may be butterflies. Some of you have had butterflies. Uh, It may be the hormones are raging. It may be romance. All right, it may be indigestion because you ate pizza uh, after midnight last night. But it's not love. And because the Bible says, and let's just read it again, verse 6, that love does not rejoice in wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth. And so I see two natural divisions in that one verse, and so let's just do them one at a time. Here's my first big point. Number one, love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Not my words. Those are Paul's words, all right? And so sometimes love, because it is love, and not some phony or some fake version of it, sometimes what love does is it refuses to celebrate Sometimes there's a party going on, and love doesn't join in. Sometimes there's a thing or an idea or a concept or an action, and everybody else loves it, but love says, no, I don't go there. Why not? Because love doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. We don't celebrate that which 
dishonors God. Sometimes love needs to draw a line in the sand and says, I don't cross that line. Right? Sometimes love, because it's love and it's not a phony, it stands in an antithetical position to wickedness or to sin or to any idea that doesn't bring express glory and honor to God. Sometimes what love has to do is cross its arms and plant both of its feet firmly on the ground and say, I don't go there. Does that make sense so far? Let's dig in further. Here's a sub point. A, love is not manipulation. Some of you, what you've got in your life right now, it isn't love, it's manipulation. Somebody's manipulating you, or you are manipulating somebody else. And here's how you know it, because what manipulation says is this. If you love me, you must do whatever I ask you to do. How many of you have heard that at some point in your life? I've seen it between boyfriends and girlfriends. I've seen it between mothers and sons. I've seen it between grandparents and grandchildren. I've seen it uh, between professional working people. I've seen people be manipulated. But let me tell you, if the love that you think you f are feeling says and repeats to you, if you love me, you must do what I want you to do, that's not love. All right, that's the lie that high schoolers tell each other on prom night, right? That's the lie that addicts tell their codependents because they want them to do something for them. And they're going to hold up that love card and they're going to play it often, but love doesn't manipulate. And so if you've got something that seems to be saying that, it's probably not love. Now let me give you an example. Here's what I mean. Let's say you have a son. How many of you have a son? Don't raise your hand, but some of you do. And let's say that your son, what a great uh, young man he is. He loves Legos, and uh, he, he loves video games, and he sleeps in the room down the hall. He sleeps on the top bunk of his bed. And every night, you make your son uh, cookies and warm milk, and then you take him into his bedroom, and you snuggle him down, and you say his prayers, and you tuck him into bed, and all is well. And you do this every night. Here's the problem. He's 29 years old. Does that sound familiar? Problem is, he's 29. Now, if he was nine, that's one thing, but he's 29. And he's got no trajectory. He's got no education. He's got no job. And what he wants you to do now is he wants you to let his girlfriend move into the house with him, right? You ever heard that story? Is this an old tale I'm telling you? Or does this sound familiar to some of you, right? And he wants his girlfriend to move in so that he can have somebody with whom he can stay up late till the crack of noon in the morning watching old Springer episodes while you go to work and you take care of him and you pay the bills. And all this is going along. And finally, you come to a point in the road when you say to yourself, self, today's the day I kicked the son out of the house. Sound like a familiar story? You know somebody that's living that story right now? And so you finally get to the point, you build up that emotional head of steam and you say to him, son, you need to move out. And what does the son say to you in that moment? What does he say? What card does he play? Have you heard this story before? What move does he make on the chessboard of manipulation to try to stop you from your checkmate of kicking him out of the house, which probably should have happened 10 years ago? What does he say to you? He says to you this, if you love me, you wouldn't do that, right? Never bothers to say I love you very often. And never bothers to profess his love before, but now all of a sudden, the love card is on the table. You see, here's what happens. If you're in a relationship that is built upon manipulation, very often the word comes out of love in a moment of desperation, but what they're trying to do is to manipulate you. They're trying to take the word love as a hostage, and some of you and some of the people that you love are very good at that, and I'm here to tell you to stop it. That's nonsense. Get over that. Move past that. Grow up. Learn how to love somebody for real. Don't use love as a manipulative card to play. And again, I've seen it in parents. I've seen it between friends. I've seen it in marriages. I've seen it between grandparents. And I've seen it by, between professional people. What I want to tell you today, I want to be very clear about that, is this. Love does not mean that we have to give way every time somebody asks me to do something. Are you tracking with that? Does that come as good, good news to some of you this morning? I'm giving you permission to do the hard things that love sometimes requires because real love, biblical love, 
often, very often does the hardest things imaginable. Sometimes love kicks a slacker out of the house, amen? Not despite love, but because it is love, all right? Sometimes love sends a spouse to rehab. Sometimes love stops paying the credit card bill for a fool that keeps running up the debt and doesn't know how to manage money. Sometimes love, because it's love, says that's it, that's the last dollar right there, because I love you, all right? Sometimes love locks the doors. Sometimes love changes the locks. Sometimes love takes away the keys. Sometimes love kicks a porn addict into the garage of the doghouse for a month, and if you are a manipulator and you are only using the word love as a false pretense and a false motivation so that you can control somebody else's actions, I exhort you to stop it today. It's nonsense, and it's foolishness, and it's not love. Amen? Now, a little context. Paul did not write 1 Corinthians 13 in a vacuum, and I've mentioned this pretty much every week. Paul did not sit down one day and say to himself, you know, I think today I'm going to write a poem about love. That's not what happened. Paul is dealing with a very specific context in his day, all right? And he's dealing with the Corinthian church. And one of the things that is burning on the Apostle Paul's mind, even as he writes these words, goes back to chapter 5. So let's flip back to chapter 5 just for a moment, if you will. In chapter 5, the Corinthians are dealing with a very difficult situation because there's a man in the church that has been caught in an adulterous affair. And what makes it even worse is, though that weren't already bad enough, is that the person with whom he is having this adulterous affair is apparently his father's new wife. All right, that's from the best we can tell of the context. Let's pick up a little bit in chapter 5, verse 1. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not even tolerated among the pagans. In other words, even unbelievers have better morals than you. All right? For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For although absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. You see, sometimes love, what it does is it values the spirit of a man and that requires you to do things that would be otherwise considered extreme. And so Paul is actually advising the Corinthians here to boot this man out of the fellowship of the church. Can you believe it? I thought Christians were supposed to be loving. Well, we are. Which is why sometimes love has to stand antithetically to wickedness and evil. And we, by the way, if you're wondering what happened, they did kick him out. And the reason I know that is because in 2 Corinthians... The follow-up letter, Paul's got to go back and say, okay, now it's time to restore him. He's repentant. He's apparently turned. There's enough evidence that he's changing here. Let him back in. And so Paul is saying here, look, love does not rejoice in wrongdoings, but sometimes what love has to do is the hardest thing. It's the hardest thing. And, and I'll bet you, I'm just going to guess I was not there. I do not know this uh, for sure, but I'll bet you when the Corinthians uh, gave that man his pink slip because he was consistently living in unrepentant sin, I'll bet you, I just wonder if he didn't pull the love card and say, I thought you loved me, All right? I thought this was the church. I thought this was where we put up with anything. I, th I thought this is where grace rules the day. I thought, I thought this is where we preach Jesus' love. I thought I was just loving this person by being in this affair with her. And unfortunately, love sometimes draws a line and says, no, we don't go there. So love doesn't manipulate. If it's manipulative, it's not love. That's point A. And here's sub-point B. Love is not the same as tolerance. Now, if I haven't already made you mad yet... Here we go. I'm about to step in it. You ready? Love is not the same as tolerance. Now, manipulation says if you love me, you'll do whatever I want you to do. Tolerance says something very similar, but you'll notice a slight difference. Tolerance says if you love me, you must approve of whatever I do. Now, tolerance is a good word. Didn't Paul just say, didn't we just talk a few verses ago about love being patient and kind? And I even mentioned that the Old 
a word there is the word long-suffering, which would seem to mean that one ought to be willing to go a long way and put up with a lot of stuff in order to be loved. And so, yes, in one sense, long-suffering or patience or tolerance is a very good thing. Unfortunately, what's happened in our day is that the word tolerance no longer means what it used to mean. Tolerance and long-suffering are no longer the same thing. And nowadays, we've modified the definition of tolerance so that it means something much more along these lines. Tolerance is the unquestioning acceptance and even legitimizing of any and all lifestyle behaviors regardless of their ethical content. You feel where I'm going to go with this? But that's not love. Because love doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing, right? Now, at this point, um, somebody raises their hand with an objection. And the objection goes something like this. Aha, but, but, how do you know what wrongdoing is? And they begin to play the philosophy angle. And they get a little clever. And they say, wait a second here. How do you know what wrongdoing is? How, how do you know, preacher? All right? I mean, you're just another guy like me. Uh, isn't wrongdoing really just a matter of subjective preferences? I mean, after all, if I like A and you like B, who is there, is there really to mitigate that conversation and tell us what's actually right and what's actually wrong? Don't we all have to just throw up our hands in a sea of relativity and despair and say, well, we don't always really know what's right and wrong, so shouldn't we just follow our best guesses and preferences, right? Right? And I will concede one point in that objection, that is that I am nobody to say what right or wrong is. However, God Almighty is the one with authority to determine and to delineate the difference between good and evil. Why is that? Because God Almighty is the one who created the universe, and he makes all of the laws, right? He makes the laws of gravity, for instance. He makes the laws of physics. He determines the laws around which the entire universe operates, and that includes the laws of ethics and morality. And if you ever become a god, if you ever create your own universe, if you ever make a world in the space of six days, then you can make your own laws. But until you do that, then God is God, and he gets to determine what is right and wrong. And so if somebody ever asks me, well, how do you know what right and wrong is? Well, what I do is I turn to the Bible, and I open up to those sections of the scripture that we call the law. Because the law delineates for us what is righteous and what is unrighteous, what is good and what is bad, what is holy and what is not, and love cannot and will not rejoice in wrongdoing. And it doesn't mean that God is mean, and it doesn't mean that your pastor is mean, and it doesn't mean that Christianity is cold-hearted. What it means is that God loves us enough that he would reveal to us what serves to his glorification and to our sanctification, and he eliminates or moves off or cuts to the side those things which would be the path of self-destruction for us and for others. Does that make sense? Okay, so the law of God is not God being mean or stingy. The law of God is actually there to protect you. You have to understand this. The law of God is like a sign on the road, bridge out ahead, right? Right? Is that someone says, oh, those, the road construct, they're just mean people. They put up these signs, a bridge out, road closed, danger. No, they're warning you that if you continue on that path, it is the path of self-destruction. The law of God is a very good thing. If you ever bought a product at the auto zone, maybe antifreeze, and there's a warning label on it that says hazardous material, do not drink, right? And what does that label do? It warns you that if you take this into your system, it's going to kill you. So it's not just that I like Gatorade and you like antifreeze. It's that one restores your body and the other will serve to your death. That's what the law is. The law is good. The law is kind. The law is just. The law is mercy. And so at this point, I think we should probably have a word about human sexuality. You ready? Here we go. Human sexuality. There is nowhere else in our contemporary culture, where the battle over the definition of the word tolerance is raging more rampantly than here in the realm of human sexuality. Nowhere is the false doctrine of tolerance pushed harder and more aggressively than in the area of sexual ethics. But you need to hear me 
and I want this to be just abundantly clear, we must not rejoice in wrongdoing no matter how relentlessly, no matter how emphatically, no matter how vociferously our culture and our times attempt to force our minds into their molds, we cannot rejoice in wrongdoing. Somebody say amen. And so just to be even more clear, that includes adultery. If you're in adultery right now, you need to stop. You need to repent. You need to turn back and you need to turn away from that. That includes cohabitation before marriage. If you're a young person and you're considering getting married and you're going to try it out first, don't do it. It violates God's holy law. It's not his best plan for your life. Get out of that. Repent. Turn away. That includes homosexuality. That includes bisexuality. That includes polygamy. That includes friends with benefits. Anything else that you have in your life and you're experiencing it and you think it is great and it is wonderful and it is fine, and if it's not marriage between one man and one woman, I'm going to tell you it is not love. And I'm drawing a line right there. You can cross it with me if you want or you can stand where I'm standing, but that's what I'm going to hold to. Okay? Now you can tell me all kinds of things. You can tell me it's romance. And you can tell me that your feelings are involved. And you can tell me that everybody else is doing it. You can tell me that everybody else approves of it. You can tell me that it's private expression between two adults. You can tell me that nobody's going to get hurt. But love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Love does not celebrate what is not in accord with the word of God. And now what I'm going to tell you next, I want you to pay attention with so critically because this is absolutely important. If you've fallen asleep, and I I doubt you have because I see all eyes, pay attention now because what I want to do is to expose what I'm going to call the false doctrine of hatred. Okay? The false logic of the doctrine of hatred. It goes something like this. And you're going to see this everywhere. Everywhere you're going to see this. You're going to see this on TV. You're going to read this in the newspaper. You're going to experience it in the classroom if you're in school right now. Here's the logic of the world, and my job is to expose it as false. It goes something like this. A, premise A. Love demands that we tolerate one another's behavior. That sounds okay, maybe. Premise B. The opposite of love is hatred. Premise C. Therefore, intolerance is the same as hatred. Have you ever heard that argument before? Okay, maybe they didn't spell it out just as clearly as I did, but I guarantee you've heard it before, and if you haven't, you're probably not paying attention. Now, I'm going to tell you, one of the best classes I ever took in college was a class called Logic. Everybody else hated it, but I loved it, because what we did is we we analyzed argumentation, and we went over all kinds of syllogisms and things like that, trying to expose arguments for the flaw that was in it somewhere, and so we'd say things like this. Uh, We'd make up a syllogism, all men are mortals, premise A. Socrates is a man, premise B. Conclusion, therefore, Socrates is what? He's immortal. And that argument was sound, and it was cogent, and it was logical, and everybody agreed that that was a proper argument. And so sometimes you look at an argument, and it looks good on the surface, but what's happening here is that somewhere along the line, there's a flaw in the argument. Does anybody see it here? Let's look at it again. Love for a person demands that we be tolerant of their behavior. Sound reasonable? How many of you are sketchy on that? A little sketchy. B, the opposite of love is hatred. How many of you are buying that? Just for the sake of argument? I will. C, conclusion. Therefore, intolerance is the same thing as hatred. Now, there's the bite of the argument right there. And because over and over again, you're going to be told that if you don't go down the tolerance path, what you are is a hater. You are mean, you are angry, you are cold, and you hate people. And if you haven't heard that yet, you will. But here's the problem. Anyone see the flaw? The flaw is where? It's in premise A. Because it confuses person with behavior. Do you see it now? Premise A confuses essence with action. And I think any sane or reasonable person can differentiate the difference between loving somebody and unqualifyingly approving of everything they do. There is a difference there, right? 
I mean, you do have children, right? It is possible to love your child and not approve of what she does, right? So there's a difference between person and behavior? Yes, of course. And so as I've been thinking about this series today, coming into this message, I've been asking myself, how is it possible that intelligent people, how is it possible that in our society we have intelligent, educated people, doctors and lawyers and members of the media and educators and advocates and writers and bloggers, and they're pressing this logic as though it makes sense, and that how is it possible that anybody believes this? Clearly it's false. And by the way, it is a doctrine, in case you're wondering. It's as religious as any other doctrine of any other religion. It is deeply held and sincerely believed. But the problem is, it is absolutely false. My question is, how do intelligent people believe and propagate this? Here's my answer. I don't think they actually believe it. I think they know it's wrong. I think they know it's false. Why do they keep repeating it? They keep repeating it because it works. Because nobody wants to be considered mean or nasty or cold or a hater. And so it works. So here's what the Christian church needs to do. The Christian church needs to be loving enough, sincerely loving, to look the gay community in the eye or the young couple that is living together, cohabitating before marriage, or to look the adulterer into the eye, or look the porn addict in the eye, or whoever it is, and with tears, if necessary, a trembling voice, if necessary, and we need to compassionately and sincerely tell them that true love is not to be found anywhere else but in God's plan for their lives, God's perfect and holy will for their lives, and we need to love these folks enough, and now I'm going to make the rest of you mad at me, we need to love them enough to invite them into our lives, to invite them into our churches, to invite them into our homes, to invite them to share meals with us so that we can build relationships and love them enough so that when their search for love comes crashing down, and by the way, it will come crashing down at some point, we'll be the ones, Christian believers, standing there with arms wide open, ready to embrace them and to show them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in doing so, we will demonstrate the second major point that I want to share with you today. If the first point was love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, here's the second main point of the sermon today, and I'll be briefer here. Number two, love does rejoice with the truth. Love celebrates. Love magnifies. Love gets excited about the truth. Love honors the truth. Love rejoices in the truth. Love exalts, lifts up, magnifies. Any other word, love loves the truth. And sometimes, here's the deal. Let me cut to the chase. Love actually hurts because sometimes the truth is what hurts the most. Anyone ever experienced that before? I have a friend in my life just the other day who got a diagnosis of cancer and they just removed a malignant tumor from his body and they said it was the size of a peach. Can you believe that? Huge, malignant cancer tumor. It'll kill you. This thing will kill you. And the doctor had to look him in the eye and say, you've got cancer. But, but as Christians, we can actually rejoice in a diagnosis because the next thing the doctor says is, here's what we're going to do about it, right? There's a surgery available. There's a remedy available. Cancer can kill you, but there is a remedy available. For Christians, that remedy is the gospel. The diagnosis is death. The diagnosis is your lawbreaker. The diagnosis is you need to repent right now before things go from bad to worse. The good news, however, is the gospel. And as Christians, we believe the good news of the gospel. Therefore, we rejoice in the truth. If you want to love somebody, share the gospel with them. Never forget one of the most loving things somebody ever said to me in my life. (laughs) You'll enjoy this. Seven years ago, I was at my home church. It was on the Lord's Day, just like this. Great sermon. Everybody's feeling festive and joyful. And we gathered together in the narthex, and the adults would drink the coffee. And we always laid out uh, cookies for the kids. And there's a, there's a little child there, and I, I was the youth director back in those days. And I got down on my knees, and I was talking to her right in her face. And I said, how did you like church today? How are you doing? Isn't, 
Isn't this great? And she looked at me and she said the most loving thing anybody had said to me all day. Matt, your breath smells like doggy doodle. <laughs> and that, that was love. That was true love because sometimes the most loving thing you can possibly do is just tell someone the truth, right? Thank you, little child, for telling me my breath smells like doggy doodle. Now I will immediately go and brush my teeth. I can do something about that. I did not know. I was not aware. But now that I know, steps can be taken to remedy the situation. Flip with me to Matthew 23, and we'll end here. Somebody says, well, my, this sermon sure was, sure was harsh today, Pastor Matt. And I'm not sure if I'm going to come back. That was harsh. I'd like to hear about love. That was some, that was some tough stuff. I don't, I don't know about that. Well, I want you to hear the words of the most loving man to ever live. Who is the most loving man to ever live? Jesus. Here's what he said to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. I'll just, I'll just start at verse 25. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside you're full of greed and indulgence. You blind Pharisees. First, clean the inside of the cup and the plate, and the outside may also be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs. You picture that right there? Picture a grave that's been power washed on the outside. It looks good and clean on the outside, but inside there's a rotting, stinking corpse which outwardly appears beautiful, but within are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Verse 29, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and you decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying if we had lived in the days of our prophets, we would have not taken part with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Most loving man that ever lived said that. The most loving guy on planet Earth just said that. That wasn't me, that was Jesus. The one who died for your sins. The one who shed his blood for you. The one who went to the cross for you. Repentance is not a stab in the back. To tell somebody to repent is not an insult. To tell somebody to turn away is not an offense. It is not an insult. It is not a betrayal. It is not mean. Repentance is a life raft. Repentance is an opportunity to turn. If you want to love somebody, if you want to truly love somebody, the highest expression of love is sharing the gospel with them. Tell them, God created the world in six days, and he rested on the seventh. And as the creator of all things, God sets the rules. He made the law. He revealed the law and the Ten Commandments, among many other places. And tell them that they're a lawbreaker. Tell yourself that you are a lawbreaker. But then remind them in the next breath that God sent a Savior, a Redeemer, one who loved enough to go to the cross his body was pinned to a stake, for goodness sakes. And he was raised again. And now he sends the Holy Spirit. And the door is open. The time is now to turn and to repent and to believe. The time is open to turn to Christ and repent and be saved and be forgiven. But there will be a time then that door will close. And we are loving to tell them that it is true. Why? Because love does not rejoice in wrongdoing Love rejoices with the truth. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, woe to me if I would preach a message of repentance and not repent myself. Woe be unto me if the denunciations of the Pharisees would be found to describe my life. And so now, in the best way that I know how, and before we come to the Lord's table as the elders come forward, we turn to you and we ask for your forgiveness. For you are good and kind and loving and just. Your love is always true and it's always real. Your love always tells us the truth. Your love is never a pretense or falsely conjectured to us to manipulate us. Your love always stirs, transforms, renews, invigorates. Your love is good. And now, Lord, as we come to the table of the Lord's Supper, be with us, we pray. Meet us here at the table. We are all just sinners, every one of us. Whatever our inclination, whatever our lifestyle, whatever our behavior, married, single, divorced, this, that, this party, that party, whatever race, whatever ethnicity, whatever background, whether we're old or whether we're young, whether we're educated or uneducated, whether we're employed or whether we're not, every single person in the room today needs your son Jesus and his blood. So please forgive us, we pray. We thank you for this table. In Jesus' name, take these common elements Set them apart for us for a holy usage as we meet you here in Christ's name and all God's people said, amen. Amen.